that paragraph properly. So I just wanted some like review on it. So I I think I still have to work on it personally before I go forward because um um I understand a paragraph right. It you have you're talking about a topic you introduce you want to say something, and within saying something, I mean to develop that. Now that is where the divisions will come. But it's from the same paragraph, so it's like yes, you have you want to write about or say anything. You have it, so that's like probably could be the the topic sentence. Then in that topic sentence, to build on that now, that's will be like the subdivisions, right? And it must be cleared and dated. And then in, in all of everything have to be said in this first paragraph. That's the whole thing, you know. Because as I was like thinking, if if I start talking about the sunshine, I cannot go down the road and start to talk about rain. So it's so much to get from this first paragraph, which has to be like really outstanding. And then, then come the thesis now. How would I derive the thesis on all of this? And it's like, this was my dilemma. So I think I need to look at more examples and to keep going over and to make sure I'm not mixing up the topic sentence from the thesis and all what is required that coming out from this very first paragraph. Okay, so. Okay. so well, Mm -hmm. Ooh. Deep breath. <laughs> I'll drink some water. <laughs> right. So, technically speaking, even though you're starting with the introduction, the introduction is the first thing people will read. The introduction doesn't necessarily have to be the first thing you write. So let me let me clarify what I mean by that. And especially in longer projects, right? So going far beyond this, when you all eventually decide to go for your PhDs and whatnot, and you have dissertations to write, sometimes your introduction is the last thing because after you do all your research and all your exploration, you ha now have to go back and frame how you're introducing your reader to all of that. And so the introduction becomes structured that way. For now, um, you really, you don't have to give away what exactly is going to be in your essay, in your introduction. What your introduction is meant to do is really give people the background to the topic, the issue that you're going to discuss in your essay, right? So yes, if we are talking about the weather, your introduction will talk about you know, the importance of studying the weather and how weather patterns might be confusing if you're not from the place, but understanding the weather patterns um, would be beneficial. And in Trinidad and Tobago, we have two major seasons which are blending together. For, for, for the ones who are older, we remember when dry season was dry season and rainy season was rainy season. And now is dry rainy season all year long. But um, if we're doing an analysis by my division then, and we want to talk about understanding Trinidad weather, right? We will look at the two main seasons. We have a rainy season, we have a dry season. What are the aspects of the rainy season? So how do we understand a rainy season? I, and that will be one section or maybe one to two paragraphs. And, and what we understand by dry season, which would be at least one paragraph. So the introduction then wouldn't necessarily spell out, I am only going to talk about rainy season and dry season. We might have an in-between season that nobody recognizes, that, that, that flux season that seems to be all year round now, right? Where um, we shift from rainy to dry and um, sometimes shift back and then come back and so that might be your third paragraph looking at uh, what weather is like now. So those are the subdivisions when we talk about um, Trinidad weather. We're talking about rainy season, dry season, and that in between um, short season, right? We might, or we might talk about um, rainy season, um, dry season and what I would call Hamatan season when the dust, the Sahara dust starts coming, though again, that is no longer a season. 
used to be a season. Used to be um, in from I say I think December, January, February used to be when Sahara dust was here, and then by March we stopped talking about Sahara dust. Now it's Sahara dust all year round, which is disturbing. But you know, um, so we would look at the three major subdivisions of. If I were to explain what Trinidad weather was like to somebody, these are the three things I need to explain for them to understand Trinidad weather. So in my introduction, I'm really only telling you that I'm going to talk about Trinidad weather and help you understand Trinidad weather. So the thesis then is to understand Trinidad weather, you need to know about rainy season, dry season, and Sahara dust season, right? then the topic sentences coming out of that would, would all come from your thesis statement. So your thesis statement is the guide for your entire essay, introduction and everything, right? Your introduction needs to lead up to that thesis statement. And the thesis statement, once you get it down pat, will tell you what each topic sentence will be for your body paragraphs, right? So, um, the topic sentence for an introductory paragraph really is, is, is supposed to set the tone that this introductory paragraph is going to give me what the topic is, what the issue is, background to that issue, why is it an issue, why is it important, right? And then I will end with my thesis statement. So the topic sentence for your introductory paragraph is really meant to clue your reader in that in this paragraph, I'm going to tell you all the background information you need to know before we actually discuss what we need to discuss in the essay, right? So um, start with your thesis statement. When you start with your thesis statement, you then know how I need to introduce that thesis statement to get, to get your introduction, right? So always the first thing is starting with your thesis statement. Um, I don't believe I shared it with you all. There's a video I did on how to pick a topic, um, including, which should help, especially in the pre-writing. Um, I would add that it is geared towards people writing argumentative essays, but the basic principles still apply if you're writing expository. So remember the difference between um, argumentative and expository. Expository is simply trying to explain. It's not trying to convince you of anything. It is not a controversial or contested topic. It's a topic that um, I would say pretty much stable, but people might not know the ins and outs of it, they might, they might need more information on it. As opposed to an argumentative essay where the topic is not stable, there are definite sides of the issue and you're trying to show which side has the better point so it's more viable, you know, um, than the other side. So that's the main difference between expository and argumentative. So even though the video is geared towards people writing an argumentative essay, the core principles are basically the same. Um, pick a topic that, that you know and like. Unfortunately, in this, in this class, I gave you topics, but in general, when you're writing, you pick a topic that you know very well. Because if you know the topic very well, you know the background to the topic, you know what issues are, are going on in that topic. Um, and it is a bit easier to write about it. If it's a topic you know very well, you know it very well because it's something that you feel passionate about in some way. Either you hate it extremely or you love it extremely, but the emotional attachment to what you're writing will be there. And that too will make it a lot easier to get through the process. Um, there's nothing worse than writing about something you do not care about. You're just writing because you have to write it. And it shows up in the writing that I, I just wrote this because I have to write this, right? Um, as opposed to writing about, about something you really, that really interests you in some way. 
and that again that could still be expository so you know you might be interested in um online learning so we're not we're not going to argue whether online learning is better than face to face or vice versa you just want to explain what the process or what online learning means right and if we're looking at abd online learning has um three forms or three subdivisions that we can look at distance learning which is what we're doing right now so we're all in our own homes and we're zooming in together and we're studying together um the a what we call asynchronous so the the um the information on canvas that you could go through on at your own pace and um what we would call blended which is half distance or half face-to-face, -face, which is not possible in COVID, but half face-to-face -face and half asynchronous, right? So this class is supposed to be blended. Um, the, the blend now is distance and asynchronous. So you can go on Canvas and you can look up things, you can read through, um, prepare your questions, and then you come to class and we have class discussions. And so the two sections work together to make the whole classroom or education experience. So if I'm writing an ABD on online learning, I want to write about the three main divisions, which are um, distance learning, totally synchronous. We meet and we have classes and we do virtually what we would have done in class. Um, totally asynchronous, so there's just information online and you read and you go at your own pace, you answer your questions, you write whatever, and you never meet your instructor, um, but you, you, you are totally immersed in, in the experience on your own time and then blended where we have half face-to-face, -face, half asynchronous, studying on your own, right? So, the ABD is taking a big, complex, scary sounding thing like online education. And um, if you're listening to the news, it, it, it is still very problematic what we're going through right now. Um, there's a large percentage of our students in primary school and secondary school who do not have devices, far less internet um, connection, connectivity. So there are a lot of people who are locked out of the online um, platform. Other things I've been hearing, um, which I find insane, is that students in primary school, for example, their online experience is day long. So it's like if you were going to school. And this is really not the best option for online learning because screen burnout is, is, takes um, a shorter time than face-to-face -face burnout, right? Um, now, the average adult has 90 minutes of concentrated attention. They could, they could uh, um, take things in for 90 minutes. After 90 minutes, it all starts to turn to mush and noise. Um, it is a shorter time for, for, for younger children. So sitting, in front of a computer from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm not sure how much is really sinking in. And, if, and we might argue, well, if you left them on their own, they're on the phone all day or they're on the computer all day watching videos, playing games, whatever. But the association is different. Right? Um, and so these are some of the, the, the issues. So if you're talking about why explain what, what um, online learning is, these are some of the issues where we need, why we need to discuss what online learning is and what, how we're really supposed to do online learning, right? Um, so if I start with my thesis, Understanding online learning means understanding the three modes of, of, of internet learning. Um, lo, um, distance, asynchronous, 
and blend it. From that, I know how to craft my introduction. So my introduction needs to show people why this is an issue, why is it significant that we talk about it, and how am I going to really discuss and, at, and the how am I going to discuss it boils down into your thesis statement, right? So the topic sentence for an introduction like that is, would be um, something that sums up all this background information, right? We are in a um, distance or oh, online learning is now becoming the primary platform for education. So from that, I know this introduction is going to Good morning. It's going to talk about why online learning is now the major platform and then why is it important that we understand online learning and then, but let me tell you what online learning really is, right? So the difference, the topic sentence usually, even that topic sentence comes out of your thesis statement, right? So you pick a topic that, that, that you know something about, that you're familiar with. So you kind of know what the background is. You kind of know what the major discussions are going on in there or the issues um, or the misinformation. And that leads to a better writing experience, right? Um, I think part of the problem, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think part of the problem is that we associate writing with a chore. It's something we have to do, but it's something we could want to do and enjoy doing because we're expressing our thoughts on a topic that interests us, right? So even if you are given um, specific topics to write about, if you're given a question, find what interests you about that topic and run with it. That gives you your insight, that gives you the motivation to write. All right, so um, we can spend some time if you want further clarification on ABD, the mode itself. Um, this week we're supposed to go over what you've read, if you, if you manage to read the samples, and what, you, what you've learned from them in terms of what ABD is. Um, if I go by Francine, there's some things still to clarify and some extra reading to be done, right? Um, that's no problem. This is, like I said last week, this is the first time you are, you might be thinking of writing in such a systematic, structured way. That takes some getting used to. It, it takes a lot of practice. Um, I've had... Ooh, um, yeah, that sounds bad, boy. I've had um, about 20 years of practice doing this kind of structured writing. I feel old now. Wow. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't need to count it up here. Um, Excuse me, miss. I have a yes. question. Yes. Um, so like how you were talking about the um, thesis being your topic sentences for the rest of paragraph, right? And you talked about the, um, you are talking about the weather of Trinidad and you say, okay, you could start with the dry season and the, the rainy season, etc. What if I left it broad and be like, okay, the impacts, the solution. Can I leave it like that? Or I have to say specifically well if you're doing an abd what we're discussing are the three divisions right the two to three divisions of that topic it's usually three because we're talking about a five paragraph essay right so we look for three so you don't want to be um if you're talking about um impacts and solutions that's a cause and effect essay that's not an abd essay right? That's a completely different mode where we would be looking at what are the causes of or what are the effects of something. So for this specific mode, we want to look at, here is how uh, we want to look at the three sub 
sub um, divisions that help us understand the whole thing. Right, so weather is a complex topic, but if we discuss the three subsections of Trinidad weather, you'll be able to understand what weather is, right? So it's a slight difference. So your thesis will be guided by the type of essay you want to write. Okay, thank you, Miss. Any other questions, clarification before um, we jump into this week? All right, so this week is an extension of our discussion of ABD. Excuse me one minute. Uh, yes. Um, as well as some other um, grammatical grammar issues, uh, parts of speech, and so on. So I'm going to switch over now to Canvas and we will just go through the module. Excuse good morning, Miss. Morning. When is this entire thing due for? Because I have a due date, October the 24th, introductory paragraph. That is just the introduction alone. The introduction and the outline. And that's it? Yes. And when is everything due? Everything like what? Like the entire essay, like with the body and conclusion. And no, we're not writing a full essay yet. Now, you can develop a full essay for your portfolio, but at this point, um, I won't, I'm not requiring that you write the full essay. We're working on being able to pre-write, so organize, plot out, brainstorm, introduce, right? Okay, thank you. Right, so um, we're looking at doing outlines specifically for an um, ABD, but outline in general, writing an outline for an essay, an outline for an ABD essay, how to write an introductory paragraph in any mode. Um, the four common academic purposes and identifying audience tone and content, right? So the first thing, um, writing a thesis statement, right? Let's talk about thesis statements. Whatever type of essay you write, you must have a thesis statement. Usually we think of thesis statements for more complex essays like research papers and even dissertations. Basically a thesis statement is one or two sentences which identify your topic, your main idea, and your purpose or why you're writing. You see, you see, your thesis statement is your legend. It makes your paper mappable and easier to follow. 
It is the main idea of your essay. So let's look at what a thesis statement does. It describes your topic. That is what your essay is about. It introduces a specific claim you're going to make about your topic. And it describes three ways in which you will support and develop your claim. So that's subject plus claim plus three points of support. And that is your basic thesis statement. Akin to a pronouncement, such as violent video games should be age restricted, or the legal drinking age should be raised, a claim is your opinion of your topic. To support, typically after the claim you will state three supporting phrases or clauses. Each supporting phrase or clause becomes a topic sentence in your essay. Remember, a great thesis statement is one to two sentences long, framed as a statement and not a question, clearly points out the subject of the writing, and takes a stand rather than simply announcing the topic. To begin, start with the question. When you answer the question, that is your thesis. Here's the process in a little more detail. You figure out what your topic is, what is your stance or claim? What is your opinion of the topic? What is your rationale for the stance? What concessions will you make to qualify your stance and acknowledge opposition? Again, you make a qualified claim, not a strong claim. And then you add your qualification, stance, and rationale to create your thesis statement. Here are 
are some examples of weak thesis statements. A weak thesis statement can be too broad. Cats make great pets. Why bother writing about that? Your thesis statement can be too narrow. Cats make great pets because they are fluffy. They might have other criteria for being great pets. Or your thesis might be off topic altogether. Cats make great pets because calicos are either females or sterile males. That is not a criteria for being a great pet. So I'd like to add at the end of this video, technically it is, um, it leans more towards the argumentative or persuasive style of writing. But what I want you to take away from it are the core concepts of how you construct your thesis statement, right? So you can, um, uh, I'll put it two ways and I don't want to sound confusing. So forgive me if, if it's confusing. All writing has a stance or opinion, whether it's expository or argumentative, right? It's based on your understanding of a topic. It's based on your, um, the, your, your culture, so your morality, the way you see the world, and so on. So even embedded in a simple explanation, there is a stance where it becomes more expository is that instead of asking for in the example you saw so instead of asking um who is responsible for the obesity um epidemic childhood obesity right you might ask what leads to childhood obesity so we're not trying to blame anyone specifically we're looking at something that is pretty much accepted by science, the three things that would, that can lead to child obesity, which would be poor eating habits, bad exercising habits, and um, the, I don't know, what's the third thing? You have poor eating, you have lack of exercise, um, and I suppose, let's say lack of education, just to round off the tree, right? So you won't be looking at why parents are more to blame than general society. You'd be looking at why do we have the issue of childhood obesity, right? So you're taking out that the controversy, and when you take out the controversy, it uh, becomes an expository piece of writing, something to explain rather than something to convince you that, hey, this is how we really should be thinking about a topic. But everything else still stands. So the idea that you know what the subject is, um, you're making a claim, and you're giving supporting evidence, those things still stand. The only difference is in expository writing, the claim isn't picking a side. That's the main difference. The claim is simply stating that um, there are three causes to childhood obesity. I'm not gonna ask who causes it because we know it happens. We know child obesity exists. It's not a contentious issue. How does child obesity, um, how do children become obese? It's not a contentious issue in and of itself. There are scientific measurements, processes, and so on. Right, so um, eating habits, exercising habits, and general lifestyle, if you want to put it that way, are three of the 
contributing factors to childhood obesity. No one is going to argue that. These are things that science has come out and told us. So it's not a contentious issue. So the question you ask of your topic becomes very important. The question you ask of your topic determines if you're going to do an argumentative essay or an expository essay. It determines if you, what kind of expository essay or what kind of argumentative essay you're going to do. So if I have the topic childhood obesity and I ask who causes uh, childhood or who facilitates children to become obese, that's um, a different quite that, that deserves a different kind of answer and approach than what causes child obesity or what is child obesity, right? So when the question just wants a simple explanation, we know we're doing an expository essay, right? And we will talk about um, cause and effect in more detail in uh two or three weeks i think it's a third it's a third type of essay that we do um third or fourth the whole method that i don't remember at the moment right but the takeaway here when we're talking about how to write your thesis the takeaway is that there are components the thesis statement the question you pose to your topic and how you answer that question helps you derive that thesis statement um and even though the, the video itself leans towards writing argumentative theses, um, it is such a slight tweak between argumentative and expository. Expository, I just want to explain. Argumentative, I want to explain to prove a point. So there, there's that one fundamental difference, right? Thesis statements. Thesis statements. Nonfiction compositions, such as research papers, begin by telling readers what they will encounter in the text. An introduction to a research paper contains a thesis statement dash. A one or two sentence statement identifying the compositions. Topic. Main idea. Purpose. A thesis statement builds reader interest, helps a reader know what to expect, clarifies the writer's purpose, helps a writer focus the composition, helps a writer check that necessary information is included, helps a writer make edits, cuts, and additions to the composition, thesis statements, incorrect examples. Last week, the school board agreed on a plan to station police officers in the hallways at Parker High School. A thesis statement should not be a simple statement of fact. Using city police as resource officers in the hallways of Parker High School is a first step down the terrifying road to totalitarianism. A thesis statement should not express sweeping opinions over emotional tone. Thesis statements correct example. Stationing police officers in our high school hallways is a misuse of city resources and sends the unfair message that students are not to be trusted. A thesis statement should make a point that can be supported by evidence. Thesis statements. Bad iPods are devices that transport and play music. Good iPods are the best source for transporting and playing music not only because they are compact and user-friendly but also because they store large amounts of music kinds of thesis statements. The enumerative thesis, aka three-point thesis, lists the evidence that supports your primary argument. Each body paragraph discusses one piece of evidence. 
Example, the writers of Family Guy use irreverent humor to satirize pop culture, comment on the stereotypical American family, and explore controversial themes, enumerative thesis. Though three points are commonly used, writers should use as many supporting ideas as they deem necessary. Kinds of Thesis Statements the umbrella thesis encompasses the entire argument in a concise statement without naming each piece of evidence that the author plans to use. Example, the irreverent humor used in Family Guy is not simply for shock value. The writers are commenting on much deeper societal issues. How to develop a thesis statement Think deeper. After writing a thesis statement, ask yourself, so what? Example, Family Guy is a humorous television show. So what? Revision, Family Guy is entertaining because of its controversial humor. So what? Revision, the irreverent humor used in Family Guy is not simply for shock value. The writers are exploring much deeper societal issues. Ways to expand your thesis. Say why? For many student writers, procrastination is based on fear. This fear keeps students from improving their writing because they do not take the time to fully develop their ideas. Ways to expand your thesis Say why your audience should care. Students should understand that worrying about grammar and spelling too early in the writing process will actually lead to a poor essay. Ways to expand your thesis Say how. English teachers often overwhelm students by giving them too many tasks to think about when writing essays. Ways to expand your thesis. Make specific comparisons. The key difference between writing in high school and writing in college is that your ideas become more significant and complex. Therefore, college freshmen have to learn to think critically. Ways to expand your thesis. Make an evaluation. My high school teacher's insistence on teaching me the five paragraph essay has actually hurt my writing skills. Consider the consequences. If students do not find ways to think deeper and more critically, they will never learn to fully develop their ideas. Topic sentences. Just as the thesis statement tells the main argument of your essay, topic sentences state the main idea of individual body paragraphs and directly relate to your thesis. Topic sentences provide support for your argument and direction for your reader. The Solar System Analogy Just as the Sun is the center of the solar system and orbited by the planets, topic sentences revolve around your thesis statement. The center of your argument. Thesis. Topic sentence. Okay, so again, we get a little more clarification on the difference between a topic sentence and a thesis. Again, too, you would notice that they are using more of an argumentative style than expository. And I stress again that the difference between expository and argumentative is expo expository explains, argumentative explains to prove a point. Right? Um, so that's the tweak. So, for example, um, Instead of <coughs> making the strong claim or the um, qualified claim that, that teaching the five paragraph essay hinders students from um, product writing productively, you can say that um, uh, the five paragraph essay structure can hinder students from uh, expressing themselves naturally, exploring what they really want to say, um, being involved creatively in producing a piece of writing. These aren't necessarily contentious. You're not trying to say that 
because you do this, this will happen. You're looking at the possible um, effects of learning, being forced to write a five paragraph essay. None of which I believe, but um, <laughs> that's purely explanation. So, and I like this idea of the solar system. So if you think about the thesis being the center of your essay, it's the, it's the core of your essay, it's, the, it's everything revolves around your thesis. So the topic sentences um, revolve around your thesis. The, and the topic sentence then guides each paragraph. So everything becomes very structured and organized. You will be very sure that what you're trying to convey, the message you're trying to send in your writing is actually sent. All right. Um, so again, the... Oh, okay. So again, um, these discussions are open until December. So work through those. The next thing I want to talk about is writing an outline. So all of this that we're looking at right now is pre-writing your essay. This is the pre-writing phase. So there are three phases to writing an essay. Pre-writing, where we plot out, we plan, we brainstorm, we come up with our ideas for what we want to write about. Drafting, where we start converting that outline into an actual essay. And then editing, when we go back and clarify for, um, we copy edit and we content edit. So we copy edit looking for any grammatical errors um, for that might, especially those that obscure our message. And we, we um, edit for content and we will edit for flow. So am I saying all that I need to say, content? Am I saying it in the best way, in the most organized way that people will understand, flow? So one of the pre-writing things we do is develop outlines. Let's talk about outlines. Writing an essay is like baking a cake. There are lots of steps to it and you need to prepare. An outline is like your recipe. It tells you when to add your ingredients and how to mix them together. Writing an essay becomes so much easier when you follow the recipe. This is an example of a pre-writing exercise to plot out your essay. This would be a brainstorming activity where you gather all the thoughts and information you have for your introduction, your body paragraphs, and your conclusion, and you plot them all together. Once you've gotten general ideas down, you can start to organize them even more. You would look at your introduction and you would plan how to grab attention, what kind of background information will help to outline your topic, and then your thesis statement. Notice that the thesis statement comes at the end of your introduction. When you've done that, you can plot out your body paragraphs. You will come up with your topic sentences based on the supporting details you put in your thesis. 
each support becomes its own topic sentence for its own paragraph. Make sure your topic sentence is a complete sentence. Then for your conclusion, you will restate your thesis, paraphrasing or using synonyms where possible, and offer any closing thoughts. Do not introduce new topics or new ideas into your conclusion. Also, make sure your conclusion isn't set in stone. Do not assume that at the end of your essay, there will be no further investigation or conversation about your topic. This is an example of a polished five paragraph essay. Notice that once you've plotted out the general information in the two exercises previously outlined, you will now come and write a proper thesis statement sentence and topic sentences. The supporting information does not need to be in full sentences. However, you will take the opportunity here to plot out how each sentence and how each piece of evidence would flow into the next. The suggestion here is that you have at least two pieces of evidence per supporting point for each topic sentence. You will follow the same process for your following body paragraphs. Note that enthymeme is just the Greek word for supporting evidence. In a formal outline, you do not need to outline your conclusion. Also note that a five paragraph essay outline can be expanded for larger projects. For example, if you are writing a thesis or a dissertation, each paragraph can then become a chapter. And the supporting sentences would become paragraphs in that chapter. Now you can go out and try writing your own outlines. So the idea for the outline, as a video discussed, is to really plot out the organization of your essay. You only focus on putting down your thesis statement and the three body paragraphs. You do not need to plot out the introduction or the conclusion. In your outline, start with the thesis statement and then the full topic sentence for each paragraph. So paragraph one, full topic sentence and how you're going to flesh out or support or explain that topic sentence. Then topic sentence two, again, how you're going to flesh out um, and explain or support that, that topic sentence. And then you do it again for the third body paragraph. So what this allows you to do is to make sure that each topic sentence directly relates to that thesis. Because we can see now the thesis statement and how you pull from that thesis statement to make every topic center. So when you plot it out this way, by the time you come to drafting, it is really plugging in words, expanding words, plugging in the evidence, your quotes, your paraphrases, um, and your summaries to flesh out how you explain that topic center. So it's 
as with the analogy with the cake, it's easier to bake your cake if you know what to do and when. So as we are talking about, um, as we are talking about pre-writing, drafting, and editing, here uh, I want to start the conversation on the different parts of an essay. And I think after this is the different parts of a paragraph. Specific for your assignment due at the end of this week is looking at writing introductions. I think we, um, let me just pull you for a hot second here. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the video for, for um, paragraph, for introductory paragraph was last week. That was included in last week's uh, materials. Did you all get a chance to see it? Yes, no? Do you remember? We discussed introductions last week, no so? Yes. Um, so what I have, so, sorry, say that again? Yes, Ms. we did. All right. So we remember what goes into the introduction. So what follows here are what goes into the body and what goes into the conclusion. So I just wanted to make sure that that you remember what goes into an introduction, right? And so um, what follows here will be the rest of your essay.
So as you see with the body and the conclusion, the body, it should be tight and focused. Each paragraph should be a self-contained unit in that it should discuss completely one of the sub points. One of the major um, organizational errors that we see in writing, and this stems from not doing an outline, not um, brainstorming, not pre-writing at all, is that we'd find information that belongs in one paragraph scattered into another one. And um, what this does is that it, it, in dispersing the information like that, it makes it harder for the reader to learn from the essay. It makes it harder for the reader to get that message, right? So when we looked at um, the, the analogy of, you know, that conversation you have when the person is all over the place and you have no idea what the person is really trying to tell you, is even worse when you're reading it and it's all over the place. And if I am diligent and I want to take the time, I will go through and find the linkages in the sentence for myself. So what this means is that I'm not really explaining something as a writer because you have to go and put the information together yourself. So it's no different than someone going on the internet and just searching for things. Um, even worse, if it's supposed to be a persuasive essay, then um, you're not convincing your reader that you know what you're talking about, right? And why should I believe you? In an explanation, I, I don't know what you don't, you don't seem to know what you're talking about. So I don't know if the information is credible, believable, or if I should even take it on, right? So organization helps your reader to feel confident about the information and the message that you're sending. So the importance of doing an outline and the reason we stress that you plot the um, three body paragraphs, because the three body paragraphs, one, the major part of your essay, two, need to be as organized and structured as possible so that the information is not lost. And the conclusion is the inversion of your introduction. So where your introduction goes from the larger topic and narrows down into a thesis statement, your conclusion starts with the thesis statement and widens back out into the larger topic. Um, the reason we call it written discourse or, um, yes, well, the reason we call it written discourse is because technically it's a conversation. And the conversation doesn't end with your paper. Even if it's an expository essay, the conversation does not end with your paper. You do not want to close off completely as if this is be all, end all, end of all information, right? Even in an expository writing, new facts may arise, new explanations may arise, and your message becomes dated and irrelevant if you close it off like that and not allow for the potential of new information on your topic. Um, brings me to one of my major pet peeves. Uh, and and I, I, it's, it's a pet peeve because it's almost irrational, but I can't stand when people say in conclusion, at the beginning of their conclusion, their concluding paragraph. Um, because it is, such a a shutdown phrase nothing can come after that in conclusion there's nothing else to be said so in conclusion um and i think it's one lazy writing and two denies that you that there's a conversation going on that there might be more information later on so again it speaks to the reliability of the writer and um is one of the ways we, we analyze how the writer feels about a topic. What might be the underlying um, reasons, biases, and so on. The next thing we want to look at is tone and mood.
So the, we have mood, tone, and language. These are um, in addition to the core content of your essay. These are these are things we look for. These are things that um, help convey further meaning. So when we talk about the mood, the mood is how the piece or the, the piece of writing makes um, the person feel. It's the feeling, right? It's, the, it's a kind of the um, paralinguistic communication in the writing, right? So you can have a somber mood. The piece is very serious. It's very um dark it's joyless there's no no flourish of language or it's very you know kind of somber sad dour we can have a satirical mood where the 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 piece has a kind of playfulness making fun of ridiculing humorous it's funny it can be formal or informal some some of the registers we talked about before so formal very um, strict language um, adherence to, to standard grammar. So no contracts, no contractions. You do not start with a um, conjunction. You do not end with a preposition and some of the more formal rules. Or you can have informal where the, the writing actually takes on a conversational tone and um, so it's almost like the writer having a conversation with. So the mood is how the piece makes you, the reader, feel. And this atmosphere, this feeling that you get is based on the author's tone, the um, language, and the author's general approach to the writing. So while the mood is how you feel as a reader, the tone is how the, the author feels as a writer, how the author, what the author's attitude is to his or her topic, right? Now, be very careful, especially in expository writing, because this is one way that you reveal a bias where you don't intend to. Depending on the tone, the author's attitude and then the resulting mood that it creates. There can be sometimes a, a, a separation between what the author is trying to say and communicate and um, the actual feeling that you get. So um, in an argumentative essay, for example, the author might use a sarcastic tone while describing the opposing view. So again, sarcasm, um, is a is a way of uh, sarcasm is saying something you don't mean. It you mean the opposite of what you say. Um, it's a way of ridiculing or undermining something. So if you address your op the opposing view in an overly sarcastic tone, it suggests that you are actually quite biased about your topic that you're not willing to listen to any opposition. So we have examples. Um, um, for example, Trump is a, is a very prominent example of someone who addresses opposing views in a sarcastic tone. Uh, he actively ridicules opposing views and people who have opposing views. And it says something about the author, the speaker, when you rely on, on that level of sarcasm to show your disdain for an opposing view. It's a, just a closed-mindedness because you are not willing to accept that someone can think differently than you and how to address that, right? So if you're talking about a serious topic but you're using a lot of humor, it could backfire because it could suggest that there's a, a, a level of irreverence, a don't careness about such a serious topic because you're using so much humor. 
On the other hand, um, humor is a coping strategy. And so if used appropriately, humor could actually lessen the, the weightiness of a serious topic and make it easier for your reader to, to deal with, to grapple with that serious topic and come to a certain understanding. So as the author, you have the ability in controlling how you express your attitude to the topic by uh, in creating the mood that the reader will feel. How would the reader feel reading the um, information, right? So if we are talking about <laughs> a genocide and you want your, your readers to feel that somberness, that despair that usually accompanies being in the middle of a genocide, then your attitude cannot be sarcastic. It cannot be satirical. It should be um, serious, perhaps formal, um, and straightforward. So that the mood you create for your reader is, is um, uninterrupted by the attitude that the reader can sense. So tone is the author's attitude. Mood is the feeling created by the writer. Right? So these are stylistic choices you can make. You can influence how someone feels about the writing. So not just the information, but being able to accept the information, being able to process the information has a lot to do with the mood you create in your writing. Here's where our creativity really comes to bear on academic writing, on formal pieces, by playing around with how we make the person feel by reading it. Okay? To achieve this, of course, we rely heavily on language, especially as we are writing, right? So the words you use can make writing pleasurable or excruciating. It will affect the mood. It will reveal your tone. Um, and overall would impact how the message is received, right? So when we're talking about communication, there's a difference between intent and impact. So the impact takes into consideration the mood, the tone, the whole experience that the reader has. The intent is what the writer wants to convey. And if we are not in control of our tone, and if we don't try to um, ensure the mood that the reader gets is the mood we want them to get, we can undermine um, the message. So the impact of our message might not be what we intended. So take a look at these um, the two examples. Okay. So passage one, what do you think the author's tone is? Oh, unimpressed. Unimpressed. Is it um, personal or impersonal? Personal. Personal. So this tone reveals a personal opinion. So what do we think of the speaker or the writer here? Is he biased or unbiased, he or she? Biased. Biased. How do we take the information if we feel that the speaker is biased?
do we agree with 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 the with the suggestion or do we think that there's something behind this suggestion there will be something behind it because the person because how it personal right so here's an example of tone and he makes it worse he or she makes it worse by saying it's not that i don't like the guy and as soon as we say something like that Yes, it is. I know. I cannot sing. <laughs> we assume that um, this person doesn't like the other person. It's not that I don't like you, but... Right? And then you list off some very negative things. So, the language tells us um, the tone, the language, the register, because it's not that formal. So it makes it more personal, the language makes it more personal and suggests a contradiction between what the person is saying and what the person is feeling. And we interpret it in a certain way. So the impact of that passage is different than the intent. So read the second passage. So with the second one, is it the same information? Mm. Right, so it's the same information. But how do we feel? What's the mood of the second passage? How do we feel reading that? It's not biased. So uh... I will agree to it. Right. It doesn't seem biased. Actually, if anything, it seems like the interviewer is deeply um, invested in seeing the interviewee achieve something at some point, just not right now. So it comes across completely different. Right? So again, the use of language changes how the impact of that message. Right? So when we're using language, we can shape how our reader feels about something. Right? But we can also shoot ourselves in the foot. Sometimes trying to, to sound formal and sophisticated um, leads us to use words incorrectly. <laughs> and that is a bigger mistake than being direct, straightforward, using simpler language. Right? So, um, if you're using big words just to use big words, it, it suggests that, um, you might be showing off. Worse yet, if you use big words where you could use simpler words and you use the bigger word incorrectly, it actually suggests that you, your vocabulary is a lot weaker. So it has the opposite effect of showing off vocabulary. It makes it sound like you actually don't know um, how to use the words and you heard the word somewhere and you just slapped it in there. Or you, you did that um, right click and just came up with the first synonym that sounded impressive. Right? So, the, there's an official term for that, catechesis. The misuse of words. Um, so specifically when you use big, big words to mean simple things and you end up sounding um, pretentious. So that undermines your message. Um, if the point of writing anything is to communicate and I have to pull out a dictionary every five seconds, that's problematic, right? So 
you see an example of a catechesis here, burglar preyed on the, <laughs> that's the wrong word, um, on the elderly, right? So sometimes as simple as a spelling error can change a person's opinion of the writer. So when in doubt, use the simpler word that you know the meaning of for sure and you know how to use, as opposed to the big word that um, you might not know how to use very well or might have secondary or tertiary connotations. The other thing to remember, right? Um, so when you, for those of you who use MS Word, when you right click on a word, you get the thesaurus, right? You know that, right? So when you right click on a word, you could get synonyms. The lower in the list it is, the less related it is to the word, right? So the higher in the list is the closer it is to the word you're trying to replace. This is important because while the word might be a synonym, it might have other meanings that you don't want to convey, right? So be very careful of spelling and not trying to impress people with big words, right? Pause for a second just to stress that we should always read. And the more we read, the more we know, the more we understand. Um, not that you will get all the information in the world, but you'd be able to, to access and assess information just the more you read. Just, just a plug. Throw those in every once in a while. Now, the other thing we're supposed to look at, and I'm expanding it a little, um, making connections. So looking at conjunctions, um, conjunctive adjectives, um, transitions, and then we'll also talk about some other parts of speech. Welcome to part three of week four's tutorial. And sentence construction. Hold on. Remember, there are three basic types of sentences. A sentence is a group of words that make complete sense all on its own. It's also called an independent clause. When we talk about sentence construction, we often talk about sentence patterns. There are a set sentence pattern. Knowing these patterns helps you avoid what we call mixed construction. It also adds variety to your writing. Let's take a closer look at the elements of a sentence. You have the subject, which is the actor of the sentence. We will identify this as S. You have the verb, which is the action in the sentence, and it can be transitive, intransitive, linking, or to be. And you have the object, the thing, being acted upon. You also have the subject complement, 
which describes the subject, the object complement, which describes the object, and an adverbial phrase, which describes how, when, where, or to what degree the action takes place. Now let's look at the sentence patterns with the verb to be. You can have the subject plus the verb to be plus the subject complement. For example, the supervisor was in a good mood today. In a good mood describes the supervisor. It functions as an adjective. His clear tenor voice was quite lovely. Again, lovely describes voice, which is the main subject. Mr. James has been a teacher for 40 years. Teacher describes Mr. James. And in this case, we have a noun equaling a noun. Another pattern is a subject to be an adverbial phrase. My friends are at the library. At the library functions as an adverb and tells you where your friends are. Similarly, my friends are here. Now let's look at sentence patterns with intransitive verbs. Remember, an intransitive verb does not need any information after it for the sentence to be complete. In this case, in a few weeks, my cousin will arrive. My cousin is the subject. Will arrive is the intransitive verb. Notice that is a complete thought. My cousin will arrive. Look at sentence patterns with transitive verbs. These are verbs that need an object for the sentence to be complete. Subject, transitive verb, and direct object. The direct object, as the name implies, directly receives the action of the verb. The archer shot an arrow into the target. What did the archer shoot? An arrow. Subject, transitive verb, direct object, and object complement. The jury found the defendant guilty. Notice guilty describes the object. And what did the jury find? The defendant guilty. Most people consider Jacobson a loyal friend. In this example, loyal friend, which is a noun phrase, describes Jacobson, the object. We also have the subject, transitive verb, indirect object, and direct object. The indirect object receives the action, but is not the direct receiver of the action. Smithers gave the employees a raise. What did Smithers give? A raise. So a raise is the direct object. Who did he give the raise to? The employees. So the employees are the indirect object. They also are recipients of the action of the, story, of the sentence, but not the main ones. Now let's look at sentence patterns with linking verbs. Subject, linking verb, and subject complement. At a very early age, Joan became a Buddhist. Remember, a linking verb is a verb that has no physical or tangible action. In this case, we have a noun phrase acting as an adjective. Joan became a Buddhist. Marianne looks like her mother. 
Here we have an adjectival phrase, like her mother, describing Marianne, the subject. The cake on the table looks delicious. Again, we have an adjective describing the subject, delicious cake. Thank you for your attention and we'll meet again next week. Let's look at that a little bit more closely. Um, sentence patterns. So as in the video, we talk about sentence patterns according to the kind of verb they use. Oh, um, this varies a little bit into linguistics. So I want to stress the expectation is not that you can rattle off the patterns at the end of this. The expectation is that um, you are more aware of the patterns as you're writing sentences and you, you compose your sentences with a little more um, thought and scrutiny. So the first three patterns, again, you can look at them again. Use the verb to be either present, past, future tense, um, present continuous, past continuous or present um, perfect and so on and so on. So it uses any form of the verb to be, any of its um, tenses and any of the conjugated forms relating to, you know, first, second, third person, etc. So in the first one, the um, verb is like an equal sign, right? So you can read it as my friends equal here. So my friends are here. My friends are at the library. It tells us, it tells us, um, a simple one-to-one -one relationship. Okay. So again, you see here, when we talk about the subject complement and the subject complement describes the subject. So the verb again, acts as an equal sign, my birthday will be fun. So it is equating birthday and fun. The supervisor was in a good mood today. It's equating supervisor with mood. Um, 
his clear tenor voice was quite lovely. So again, equating voice and lovely. It becomes even more um, of an equation when we're using nouns to describe nouns, right? So we're replacing one noun with the next. So Mr. James has been a teacher. So James, Mr. James equals teacher. My birthday is on Monday. So birthday equals Monday. So again, the idea is to, to think of verbs and how verbs function in a sentence. That will clue you into sentence construction, the different sentence patterns, and should help reduce um, major sentence construction errors. Right? So the linking verb is a state of being. It is not a literal action. Right? So you can't um, feel down the road, for example. It's not an action action. It's a state of being. Right? So the cake on the table looks delicious. So we're not saying the cake has eyes and it can look at something. The cake resembles, the cake um, is a picture of deliciousness, right? So this looks is not the active verb of looking with your eyes. It's resembling or, or portraying or looking like or being similar to, right? So Marianne looks like her mother. And this would be a different sentence if we said Marianne looks at her mother. So here we are, we are comparing Marianne and her mother. She resembles her mother. Again, so you can't seems down the road, so the rain seems endless. This is a feeling or a state of being and not a typical action like we're used to. Like the um, pattern three where we use the link um, to be, here, the linking verb is acting as an equal sign. So at a very early age, Joan became a Buddhist. So Joan equals Buddhist. I feel like a million bucks, so I equal million bucks. So of all the patterns, I think pattern six is the hardest for people to wrap their mind around because it is a short sentence. So again, an intransitive verb is a verb that needs no object. It is self-contained, right? And again, knowing um, sentence patterns and knowing the function of um, the parts of speech is very helpful here in determining whether it's an intransitive verb or a transitive verb. What, complica what complicates it even more is that some verbs can be intransitive or transitive. Some verbs, um, they don't need an object. They can go without an object or they will take an object. Right? So my cousin will arrive is a complete thought. It is an independent clause. It has a subject and a verb. It does not need an object. Um, whatever you put behind will arrive is not an object, right? So if I said my cousin will arrive in a few weeks, in a few weeks is an adverbial phrase. It tells me when. But I can take it out. I can, I can take it out and the thought is still complete. Right? So you notice even when he add with my uncle or in a few weeks, 
um, arrive is not acting on uncle. It's not acting on full few weeks. It has no direct or indirect object. It does not need one. All right. So one of the um, key ways of interpreting a sentence and whether you got your sentence right is to figure out what question it answers. Right? If it's extra information in there, it's not necessary to the sentence. But as long as your sentence answers that core question, it is a complete thought. You can think of it as a complete thought. It has a subject, a verb, and it answers the question totally. The transitive verb, on the other hand, um, needs an object. It needs a direct object. So these are verbs that are action actions, what we commonly think of verbs as. They're actions that we are doing in the sentence or the subject is doing, right? So... The archer shot an arrow. Shot is an action. Arrow is the direct object. Boise caught the fish. So if we took away the object, if we said the archer shot, shot what? Or Boise caught, Boise caught what? So the information is incomplete. So it needs an object, right? So in pattern eight, we have an indirect object and a direct object. So as the video says, the direct object is what is being acted upon. The indirect object, um, benefits from whatever is being acted upon, if you want to put it that way. Right, so we could um, rearrange it, and it still makes sense. Mothers gave a raise to the employees, right? And here we see... Um, that raise is directly affect, um, acted upon by gave. So Smithers gave a raise to the employees. Notice too that uh, we need both the direct and indirect object for this to make complete sense. The last set of um, the last set of patterns take transitive verb and a direct object and object complement in the form of an adjective and the other one in the form of a noun. So, like the subject complement, this object complement describes the object. Right? The jury found the defendant guilty. Boise painted the wall green, right? So we have the direct object and we have the description of the direct object. We can also do it with the nouns or noun phrases. Notice too that there is no verb in between the object and the object complement. So may, most people consider Jacobson a loyal friend, right? There's no verb in between Jacobson and a loyal friend. There's no verb between Mildred and her mom. Another common error that we make after we talked about nouns and verbs, another common error that 
is um, subject to
So, as the video showed, there are several reasons that we have uh, we can create subject verb agreement errors. They are actually about 12 different rules to make sure that your noun or your pronoun matches your verb. Uh, you can review it more slowly, pause and start and take your notes. Uh, it's something to, to really look out for. Partly because in our vernacular, the verb could be as green as we like it to be when we're talking with our friends. It doesn't matter. But when we're writing in a formal setting, we do want to make sure that our subject and verbs agree. Oh, um, as I said before, one of the major things we should be covering this week is how to make connections. One of the ways to do that is through using conjunctions. So this is a little video on using conjunctions. Welcome to the week four tutorial, part one. This week, we will discuss using connecting words such as and punctuation, as well as sentence construction. At the end of this week, you should be able to differentiate between the three types of conjunctions, differentiate between commas, colons, and semicolons, apply conjunctions, prepositions, and punctuation effectively, and write varied sentence patterns. So let's look at conjunctions. There are three types of conjunctions, coordinating conjunctions, subordinating conjunctions, and correlating conjunctions. Coordinating conjunctions are used to link equally weighted phrases and clauses. They have the same significance. You can think of coordinating conjunctions as equations. For example, and is like an equal sign. So Jake ate cake and I ate pie. But is like a not equal sign. Jake loves cake, but I do not. Notice in these examples that the two clauses have the same weight or significance of meaning. Notice too that a comma precedes the coordinating conjunction when you are joining two independent clauses. Coordinating conjunctions also show relationship. So shows cause and effect. For shows effect to cause. Or nor indicates choice. Subordinating conjunctions. These are used to link unequally weighted phrases and clauses. One clause or phrase is more important than the other. Subordinating conjunctions can tell you why, giving you the reason or the purpose. can show you the sequence or talk about conditionality. When the clause starts with the subordinating conjunction, it is a subordinated clause.
subordinating conjunctions can also help you compare and contrast. Make a concession. Again, when the clause starts with a subordinating conjunction, it is a subordinated clause. This means that the information is not as significant as the independent clause. Prepositions. Just to remind you, prepositions are words which connect different nouns, pronouns, and phrases in a sentence. Prepositions show positions. They can tell you where one object is in relation to the other. Preposition or prepositions can tell us the timing of events. Notice the difference between at, in, and on. Uh, prepositions can tell us movement. Notice that these are compound 
prepositions, the meaning is based on either a joined preposition or two prepositions. So a compound preposition consists of a combination of words that is often considered as one preposition and connects the object of a preposition to another word or set of words. Notice in these examples the prepositions that go together. The meaning is derived from these two specific words or three specific words. If you change any of the words, it does not function as a compound preposition. It raises an error. For example, you wouldn't say according with. It must be according to. This is the end of part one. So let's take a, another look at conjunctions, a closer look at conjunctions.
So taking the opportunity to slow it down a little bit for you to look at conjunctions in depth. So conjunctions are one of the major ways we make connections. Propositions are another way we make connections within the sentence. We also look at making connections between sentences and between paragraphs. So we talk about transition and flow. Right, so we're looking at moving from sentence to sentence. We're looking at moving from paragraph to paragraph, especially if we're talking about an essay. So I think we talked about this a little before, but again, to stress that um, every sentence needs to be linked to create a flow and each sentence ex sets up an expectation for the next sentence just as we talked about asking a question after you write a sentence asking the question to see if that sentence answered that question each sentence generates a kind of question that you want the next sentence to address so if i say the sky is sunny I want the next sentence to describe to me what I mean by sunny. So I'm a, each sentence sets up an expectation that the next sentence should fulfill. And that is part of how we create flow, by anticipating what the expectation is from that set one sentence and putting the next sentence that will answer that expectation. Right. So this is again the example of um, our paragraph. And here looking at the expectations that come out of each sentence. Right. So Brian has proven to be a disruptive, inattentive and rude student. So the expectation is what evidence do you have? Right. And so the sentences that follow should tell me what evidence I have. So my evidence for him being disruptive is that he continually disrupts class by speaking out of turn. And then the next question is, so why is that a problem? So my next sentence should tell you why that's a problem. Um, the, expect um, um, my, um, the expectation might be, so what exactly do you mean by outburst? What do you mean by disruption? So I should explain that a as well. So when you put the sentences together, any question that would come up and what do you mean by he's disruptive, I explain. So that's one of the ways when we're looking at writing the outline, really asking that question. Right? Um, even when we looked at doing the thesis uh, sentence and how you revise your thesis sentence, keep asking yourself questions. So what what do I expect to be explained for this to make sense? What do I expect to explain for it to make sense? And that is how you develop your flu and transition from one sentence to the next. Right. When we are switching, when we are switching tactics, or when we're switching to another topic, transitions also help smooth out that switch. So it doesn't feel like we are jumped. We are just jumping from one thing to the next. We are actively building in ties. Right? So in this example, looking at the paragraph again, this also suggests ties in 
the discussion about being inattentive to the discussion of being disruptive. He also interrupts or he also transitions. Um, and here we have a bigger leap transitions from being disruptive and inattentive to being um, rude. So by using these transitions, I'm, I'm creating a flow and tying all the topics together so that you know that it belongs in one paragraph, why it is in one paragraph, how it connects to each other and helps flesh out the overall message. Right? Okay. I want to take um I want to take a little break here. The rest of the information I want you to look over um punctuation so really looking at commas and semicolons, dashes and hyphens. You can read, you can watch the videos and read up on your own. What I would like to do before, before uh, we run out of time is to take one of the, um, let us look at one of the discussions and split up into groups. Do you all already have groups for those discussions? for the different ABD exercises? No? Miss, how much people are supposed to be in a group? I would say um, for the size, at least four, maybe four to five. So let's look at the first one. Um, Are they have don't don't have access to any right? Um. So. Right. Now I'm going to try an experiment since I'm going to put you all into breakout groups and see if <laughs> I can still share screen. I'm not 100% sure. So um, you all say you don't have any groups. You all didn't make up your own groups yet. Yes, Miss, we make up our yes, own miss. groups. Yes, Miss. So apparently because I made it a group discussion is not letting me see discussions through discussions. So which one haven't you done yet? That might be the better op better way to go about it. So which which of the discussions have you not gotten through yet or haven't attempted yet? Any. Any? Have you all done um the reading exercise too? Nope. Okay. No. So let us try this one um, breakout room. Right. And so again, the idea here, let's just do A, B, and C. So what is the statement, uh, main point controlling principle? Who do you think the audience is? What do you think the audience is to the author's tone, right? So that's what we're looking at. I'm going to make, see, hopefully sharing screen um, works in breakout rooms. Right. 
and um I'm going to open the rooms there they're about they're five mostly five people in a in a group so together you all can read the article and come up with the um the thesis the controlling principle the different divisions the author's tone um look at mood as well right and i will pop in and see if the share screen works in the room if not uh we'll have to come up with with with, with something Miss, I have one question. Uh -huh. The groups that we formed ourselves, could we use it to do the little readings? The discussions? Yes. yes. Um, the, so as long as you have, um, I, think, I think four people, given the size of this class, four people, four to five people in a group is fine. Um, you can maintain those groups. You can maintain those groups, um, not just for group assignments, but I highly recommend um, and do this for your entire career in your in 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 university that you have people you can bounce your writing off of, and vice versa. So your own little um, support system where you can talk about what you need to write. They can read over pieces for you. You can read over pieces for them. And you support each other as, as through your career and writing. So if you are a former group and you feel comfortable with that group, keep that group with you outside of this class. You know, as long as you're in the same class, or even if you're not in the same class, but you have a writing assignment or some other assignment you want feedback on before you submit, it's always good to have peers to, to help you do that, right? Um, so it's fine to keep the groups. So, uh, any other, well, any questions um, from today? I have a question, um, for the assignment, the ABD introduction paragraph, um, number five says in a separate document, how would you grade yourself objectively? What does that mean? What should we do for that? Okay. Um, the objective here is to get you used to editing yourself objectively as objectively as possible right it's not something we do easily because we assume what we wrote is what we meant to say and we don't often reassess ourselves so in a separate document in about a paragraph or so did you after reading what you wrote reading over your your um your outline an introductory paragraph objectively. Did you actually convey what you wanted to convey? Um, do you think you were successful? Do you think you used grammar correctly? And so on and so on. So, and this is an exercise in assessing yourself, in, in um, critiquing yourself, right? So um, you are your own peer reviewer, in other words. And what it'll be interesting then to see how you think of your own writing and how your other peers think of your writing and whether you achieve the message you wanted to achieve or not. And the idea here is that seeing the difference between how people perceive your writing versus how you perceive your writing will make you more aware of what the impact is versus what your intent is. So am I really conveying what I intend to convey or is it hitting my reader in a different way? And why is that? What are they saying? How do I use that? And so on, right? So again, the main purpose in, in a composition course is to get you to think of composition scientifically, in a structured way, in a conscious way. It's not just throwing words on a page and walking away, right? So trying to give you these different techniques. So it should be about a paragraph. It shouldn't be a, you shouldn't be writing an essay on your, on your outline. <laughs> Okay. But your outline was successful, right? Any other questions? Miss, how we and how we submitting that after we 
duty paragraph grade in ourselves? Um, you could put it on a separate page. Right? No, how are we submitting it to Canvas? If you, no, as in, it will, you submit one document, but have, do a page break and have your comments on a separate page. Okay. Right? The, um, the only other option would be writing in the comments, writing a comment in after you submit. Because you know, the, um, there's a, they have the function or the option of writing comments alongside of submitting an actual file. Excuse me, Miss. I have a question about number six. So it says, um, pick two submissions from your colleagues and post a peer assessment. We're gonna send them our actual um, like thoughts and things for them to put it in their document or. No. What happens is um. Canvas would allow you to comment on other, like in the comment section, you would be able to comment on their writing. But that'll yeah. be when we post it, right? When we post yeah. the paragraph. Yes. Now, so after, after everyone has posted, Canvas will assign you automatically two people to, to peer review. And the peer review appears in the um, comment section alongside the submission. Okay, thanks. Any other questions, comments, takeaways? Miss, I saw that I already got like two people in an email from Outlook and it's from Canvas and it said one of the persons is Anjali and she's no longer in the class. Okay, um, so you need a, another peer, another person to review? I think so. Okay. Um, I will see if I could if, if I can get the system to adjust it. If not, and the person is no longer in in the class, there's not not much you or I can do about it, right? But I'll see if I can get Canvas to to reassign or readjust. So, no no questions about sentence patterns or ABD or body paragraphs or conclusions or conjunctions or prepositions, transitions and flow. No questions about any of those. Do you all want to go over it again and take your notes? Hey. Right. Okay, so um well it's eleven thirty seven. So if there are no more questions or burning comments that need to be made right now, um, again, there are some some things that we didn't go through in class, some of the punctuation, um, comma rules, the way to use semicolons versus colons, um, parentheses, dashes, um, and so on. So please review those. They are very handy, they're very important. I want to know common mistakes I'm seeing so far, people using semicolons when they need to use colons or don't need punctuation at all, right? So please review those um, punctuation rules. And if, yes. Um, I have one more question, sorry. Um, this um, paragraph, right? We, are we allowed to send you a draft before we actually submit the assignment? Um. I can't guarantee that I will be able to read it in a timely manner. I'll just be very, very honest about that. Um, if you are a hundred percent stuck and you, you're desperate and you're pulling out your hair and you don't know where to go and your fellow students can't help you in any way, um, then I am your last, I, I, I'm here. That's what I'm here for, but I'm a bit of a last resort in a, for, for timeliness reasons, might not be able to get it back to you before you need to submit it on the 24th, in other words. Um, but I, again, I'll go back to my advice. If you have a group, you feel comfortable in that group, use the group. 
and let the group use you. So if you want to share your, your um, introduction with your group and vice versa, and you give each other comments before you submit, that's fine. Right? Um, if you are 100% stuck and is far enough out from the deadline that, that I can in likelihood get back to you before the deadline, then I am here for that. My only reservation is getting back to you before the deadline for submission. That's my only reservation. Okay. Right? Thanks. Okay, so I guess um, it's been a long session. Please go over all, everything on Canvas and absorb at your own pace. Prepare questions, comments that if you need clarification by next class or if you need clarification before class, there's always the WhatsApp group. Um, that you can type out your questions. There's no stupid question. As a matter of fact, something that might be bothering you might be bothering the entire class. It's worthwhile to share it with the class. Um, and if there are no other questions or pressing anything at the moment, uh, class is dismissed and I will see you next week, Tuesday. Okay, thanks, Miss. Bye. Right. Bye, Miss. Bye, everyone. Bye, Miss.